Welcome to the Growing the Future podcast, where our future is always bigger than our past. Today, I'm speaking with Jake Legui, the CEO of Legui Farms. That is a farm that operates near Weyburn, Saskatchewan, Canada. They grow durum, wheat, canola, peas, lentils, and various other crops. Jake farms with his family, including his wife and two young sons, along with sev- several other family members. They are a third-generation farm that strives to continually improve to leave things better than they found them. Jake is involved in various places in the agricultural industry as well to try and build a better future, which is the theme of the show, so that's going to fit right in. Um, As a farmer and as an agronomist, agriculture and the science and the business therein is his fascination and his passion. Jake and I will be talking about the farming business, farming policy, and some of the things Jake is working on outside of the farm to advance agriculture today. You can find him in his blog at leguifarms.com or on Twitter as at Jake Legui. Welcome to the show, Jake. Good to see you. You too, my man. Interested in uh, our conversation here. It's going to be awesome. So. My first question I thought about that I most wanted to know today, Jake, was as a farmer going into 2021, we're getting close to go time. What is top of mind for you? What are you thinking about the most? What are you focused on right now? It's March 15th, another month or two you're going to be rolling. What What's on your mind right now going into 2021? I'm going to take an easy one here to start with and weather. Cause it's really dry. <laughs> it's dry. Yeah. Dugouts are low, if not empty. Um, soil moisture profile is cleared right out. So, you know, we don't have any snow. So, I mean, we're kind of, it's kind of feeling, I, not that I was there to experience it, but because dad has a bit of a memory for years and weather, I feel like I was there. It kind of is like the eighties a little bit, I think, you know, We've been kind of squeaking through the last few years, getting enough rain to sort of make a crop. And, uh, and now we're, we're kind of starting from zero. Not that that's never happened before and not that we can't grow a really good crop with starting dry. Sometimes we grow our best ones on the years we start off dry, but it's still kind of worrying. So when you worry about that, what's the mode of action? What, what tools, what levers might you have on that? Well, I mean, I guess it, it kind of comes down to just, I mean, it's the same thing as, as any other situation, right? You're just going to try and do a good job agronomically of getting the crop in the ground, get it at a right depth, set it up for success and just hope that it'll rain. Because I mean, really that's, that's kind of what we do. I mean, what choice do we have? It's, it's really just do the best we can and, and hope for the best. I've been reading your blog and, and one of the things you talk about quite a, quite a bit is, you know, like you said, you started the blog to vent and of course a lot of it's about the weather. I remember uh, fall 2019, I was just looking through our records as a business, uh, that had an impact. So what kind of adversity did you face with weather there in the fall of 2019? Well, certainly in, in my years on the farm, I mean, not to say that we haven't had some other challenging years, you know, we had some floods pretty pretty that were pretty rough back in 10 and 11 but in 2019 it was hard to deal with because we were right there at the finish line with that crop you know we'd been through a tough dry spring um it didn't start raining till the middle of june so we were already kind of apprehensive about what we were going to end up with and and we started harvest and i remember this because we were going to the garth brooks concert the next day and i was a little bit worried that we were going to start the peas and not be able to go We started combining peas on on the Friday night. Storm blew in. We're like, oh, well, I mean, peas are mature, but the rest of the crops aren't. They could maybe use a bit of a drink. It hasn't rained in a while. Then it rained a half inch that night, and then we got two more inches that weekend. And we never turned a wheel for another week after that. And that was was just how harvest went after that. I mean, we'd we'd get two days, get shut down, get a day, get shut down, ruts, rocks you know just damage to combines and it was a rough go i mean we were so from the 9th of august to the 30th of october we were harvesting off and on and we never actually finished which had never happened before on this farm 
to not finish harvest. So, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. I think it, I think it was the 30th of October. We, uh, we had one, one wheat field left and then we had some Durham that we needed to finish up and it snowed overnight. It wasn't supposed to, but it did. So we went out to the combines and it was, and it was just so depressing, you know, like we were so close to having it wrapped up and we were, I was almost starting to get overly optimistic about it too. Cause we'd had a couple of nice weeks thought, Oh man, maybe we can get some, some field work done. Cause I mean, we had a lot of work to do, you know, cleaning up ruts and low spots and everything else. And it, that was it. I mean, we, we combined a little bit that day, picked off the last bit of wheat, um, which was nice. Had uh, the foul supper in the cab of the combines, but we never finished the last field of Durham after that. That was, that was the end of it. So that was, so it was, a, it was a hard day. I mean, I, there's not a lot of days I've had in farming where you just, you just really feel beat, you know, like, at that morning it was just like wow we we lost this one you know and and that's and that was it so that was kind of a it was kind of a hard one to swallow and then you know the aftermath of all that too of course lots of tough poor quality grain we're trying to get rid of all winter and everything else so yeah it was a it was a rough one how does family dynamics come into play in a situation like that you farm with your dad and your your sister right um, of course, your wife's helping out in various degrees, but what 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 happens with the family uh, in crisis moments like that? Well, I mean, we you know, I guess we kind of had to rally around it. I mean, you know, my my brother-in-law Eric, he's married to my younger sister, who's not involved with the farm. Um, he's been working on the farm since 2017, and he's come on as a partner in the last couple of years as well. So this was kind of his first real firsthand view of a catastrophe, <laughs> you know, weather wise. Oh, great. Did he, yeah. he wanted to stay farming after so, that? So, you know, I almost felt like I kind of had to shelter it from him a bit, like, you know, not, maybe not show him how stressed out I was about the whole thing, because I mean, you know that you're still farming next year, but the, it changes a lot of the financial parts of your farm, right? When you lose, when you lose that kind of money in a, in a year, it, it changes, it changes your management over that next winter and into the next crop year. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you kind of have to figure out in managing the whole operation during that. So it's stressful as hell. Um, but you know, we just, we're, a, we work pretty well together as a team, you know, that Eric and Sarah, and dad and I were sort of the management group of the farm. You call it the board of directors. We, we just, you know, dad's got the experience of tons of bad years and in, in his lifetime of farming and his 40, 43 years. But this one was probably for him the worst, you know, just because we were right there and all the money was in. So yeah, that's how it felt. <laughs> just robbed, eh? So you mentioned that you changed uh, some of the financial things in the business. How do you how do you manage the things you can control with the uncontrollables that are kicking you in the nuts? Well, you know, and that was one of the hardest parts of it um, was trying to figure out what we could still control, I guess, over the course of that winter. I mean, you know, we, we also had a couple of, of land deals get dropped on us that we weren't expecting. Um, so we ended up we ended up losing some land, which was equally hard to deal with in a year like that and it's sort of adding insult to injury almost right because you know you don't you don't expect that to happen after one of your worst years and when land markets were already pretty buoyant um you know the the question that that i have to ask myself as the ceo of this thing is okay so let's say we go out and we we take this on we take on the risk and 2020 is a bad year now what you know this farm has to fund mom and dad's retirement too so i don't really feel like asking dad to go and get a job you know when he's <laughs> in his 60s <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, i mean you know like what do you what do you do i mean you can't there's only so much that i'm willing to risk i guess i i'm not okay with putting the whole farm on the line and the future of of my parents 
supposed retirement um, to try and hang on to a piece of land that that might be overpriced anyway. So it just that didn't make it any easier, though. I'll freely admit that it didn't make it any easier to let go. No doubt, no doubt. Those are complicated issues. Those are complicated issues, and I think, I mean, it's my brother's story to tell, but I think my brother's been through that feeling when you're kind of in the thick of it, and it's like, okay, not only am I at risk here, but my parents' financial well-being is at risk here based on these events, and I got to do the right thing to to get through. So have you guys got the succession planning? This is a really personal question, but have you got the succession planning set up to where you're really comfortable with it, or is it just like always a process, like always a moving target? No, we're we're pretty comfortable with where the succession plan is at this point. We've got a written document and we know we know how the next five years are gonna go until until dad's sort of retirement day. And I mean he he may retire from the risk and the management, but who knows? He'll probably work here for a long time yet after that. At the end of the day though, you know, a good chunk of their retirement income is still fairly reliant on the farm. So we can't we can't really take that away unless we put a whole bunch of money away for them. So that's, that's always going to be a bit of a, a bit of a challenge until we get a little bit later into things here in a few more years. What are the roles then between yourself and, and the others you mentioned is sort of a board of directors, as far as decision-making goes between yourself and other people working in the farm. Yeah, so um, it's kind of the four of us. Like I said, my dad, my sister Sarah, my brother-in-law Eric, and and me. I guess that what we do is we kind of have monthly meetings, except for during seeding and harvest. I guess unless we get a rain delay, and you know we'll go through all of the big things going on in the farm. Like we'll try and stay out of operations generally in those meetings, and we'll focus on capital budget, you know, normal budgeting, human resources, those sorts of things. And those bigger, those bigger decisions, particularly around capital, land, you know, those are things that we have to agree on. Um, and we do have some basic written policies around that. We're not a consensus board, I guess, but I, I don't think that we would go forward on something if somebody was super opposed to it, right? Because that'll cause some resentment. So, and then, you know, on the day-to-day -day operations though, like, so, my role as being the CEO, that doesn't mean that I'm the operations manager. Eric has more taken that role over where he's looking after the day-to-day -day operations of our, of the guys that work for us. Um, you know, keeping everybody busy in the shop and everything else. That's sort of his, his role. And then Sarah and dad kind of look after more of the trucking logistics and that sort of thing. When it comes time to hit the field though, I mean, it's all hands on deck and, there aren't really a lot of roles when it comes to that, except for the agronomy side of it, which is still mine. You mentioned something about getting an advisory board going. Is that is that fair? You just started an advisory board outside of that circle? Yeah, so I guess it would have been about a year ago. Timing was pretty good when we decided to do it after a tough year. We'd actually put the process in place quite a while before that. So we've had an advisory board since then. Um, four individuals. We actually, uh, <laughs> my dad talked to your dad a bit on how oh, to neat. set it up. Cool. Cause you guys have some experience with that. So we relied a bit on the Aberharts for, for some advice on that. And it's been, it's been awesome. It's been really good. Yeah. We've gotten really good advice out of it. Um, some, some good unemotional sober second thought kind of thing, right. That I think family businesses often need. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the value that you've got out of the advisory board and you know from the perspective of somebody that's probably heard about it and thought about it but like how do you go about it and and what has it really given you in terms of feedback sure so i guess how we went about it um i relied a bit on backswath management um terry becker helped me out quite a bit on finding people for it because you, you need the right people you need people with experience but I didn't necessarily want a bunch of ex-farmers on it, you know? I wanted people that, you know, maybe this guy's got some egg experience, maybe this woman doesn't, you know? Like, I wanted a good mix of, of skills to bring to the table. And we did find that. Um, we also knew a couple of people that uh, thought might be good at it. So, you know, we reached out to those on our own and we put the first meeting together, then COVID hit. 
So we couldn't have our, our first meeting live, which was really unfortunate. Um, we had to do Zoom for the first meeting, which worked. It worked okay, but we were missing something for sure. So we had our first live meeting in July, and that was way better. I mean, when, when everybody could actually react to each other, the advisors could get to know each other, because of course they didn't necessarily know each other either. So, I mean, we talked about, you know, um, some of our plans around working capital, our strategy there, um, building a budget and having them look through it and point out some things that are out of line. Um, looking through our financial statements to say, look, you know, these, these line items are pretty high. Like, what do you, what do you think about that? What are you doing about that? And what, what are you telling your banker about it? So it wasn't like they came in and said, oh, you need to do this and that and this other thing. It was, it was more like questioning us, are you thinking about this? Um, you know, and if you're not, you should. And if you want some help with it, we can take that offline and, and you know, me and the one of the advisors could have a discussion about something in particular. For example, one of the advisors um, is really big on strategic planning. So she helped me out quite a bit on developing our strategic plan for a farm and getting all that organized. So, no, it's been really, really good. So I like that. Um, I guess the next thing that I was wondering, Jake, is what are the nuts and bolts of having an advisory board? I think a lot of people think it's intimidating to get these fancy schmancy people to come out and and, and you got to lift your kimono and it's really a personal thing to do and you never want to impose on anybody and you got to pay them. Like I think there's a lot of things between, man, I'd like to have an advisory board and having an advisory board that just stop people, I think, from doing it. Or everybody would be taking advantage, trust me, of this relatively low cost investment and the return on it is exponential, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not costly. You know, generally... One of the one of the advisors put it really well. He said, as long as I'm getting as much out of this as I'm putting in, he said, I don't I don't really care. You know, I'm having fun. I've got pages full of notes. He's like, this is just awesome. So those are the kinds of people that you want to find, right? So you're not paying your advisors? We pay them a little bit. Some of them some of them it, some of them the problem is uh, trying to get them to take money. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. So. Well, and generally there are people that have been successful, so it's, you know, paid forward. They probably had people that helped them and now they just get a lot of joy. What what can you tell us a little bit more about what you think these people are getting from being on the advisory board, maybe from each other and from the interactions and from yourselves? Well, they're getting a lot from each other. No question about that. I mean, they're all all four of them are accomplished individuals, right? So they they get a lot out of that. And, you know, I think there is a, a giving back part of this too. Like, I, I think that they do feel, you know, that there's, there's value in trying to give back to another business the way that they might have gotten something like that in their own past lives, you know? So I think that's part of it too. And I think it's just enjoyable. I mean, it's, it, it you know, I don't think I'm alone here, but it's kind of fun talking about business and family governance and those sorts of things. Cause there's so much that goes into all that. Right. So I think they get some enjoyment out of it that way too. You talked about some areas that they highlighted and just like any good coach just got you thinking about your thinking, just asking you, not telling you is most of the time. I mean, if you highlight something, you can come up with your own answers, but what were some of those areas that you guys were started to drill down on, a, on their advice and scrutinize? Well, I would say that probably one of the, one of the highlights that they really brought for us was, yeah, okay, you know, you guys have done some work in your strategic plan, but <clears throat> really need to focus in more on getting those estate plans drawn up and, and getting that good set of legal documents that protects each one of you and protects the farm in case of whatever, something bad happening, right? Those are things that we, that we didn't, that we hadn't really done as much work on as we should have at that point so that's something that we're really focusing in on um what else could i tell you about ideas that they brought to us you know just around insurance and stuff like that too you know key man insurance and it a lot of it was just family governance stuff that we hadn't thought of before because we don't have exposure to people to bring those ideas up i mean our accountant is great 
at MNP and she brings tons of great ideas, but there's just certain things that you have to experience in your life before you really know that you need them. And these people have experienced so much that we can gain a lot from it. I'd agree. No, absolutely. So of the things you can control then on the farm going into 2021, outside of the weather, what are you looking to, to change or what levers are you grabbing, bush buttons are you pushing or what, what are you looking to nuance going into 2020? Uh, try something new or what, what's your biggest plans that way? Well, I mean, we reviewed our strategic plan over the winter. Um, it was getting, it was two years old and there were just some changes that I wanted to make to it anyway. So we went in and, and basically revamped it, redid it. Um, and then looked a little farther out as well. Like we did kind of our five year strategic plan and then looked out to 2030 and tried to as sort of a family group, you know, with everybody there, my wife and Eric's wife and mom and dad and everybody, you know, like, what does that look like? You know, not that we can go out and say, oh, you know, we're going to be farming this many acres and we're going to run this kind of equipment and everything. It, none of that really matters that much. It's more what what do we want for a lifestyle? What, you know, what goals do we have at a personal level? And what do we imagine the farm could look like at that point? So that was a really interesting exercise. We we went through and, and did the, you know, the SWOT analysis and, and uh, you know, the 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 big, hairy, audacious goal setting and, and that sort of thing and, and tried to put ourselves in a situation where it inspires us to try and achieve something that maybe we're not sure we can achieve, but we're going to try anyway. So it was a, it was a fun process and I, I think we got a really good document out of it and it gave me a lot of clarity as CEO of this to try and make sure that I set up the right action plan to have a chance at hitting those targets. So we spent a lot of time looking at that. And then through that, it kind of helped us reevaluate some of our choices on our sort of our key operating strategies with, uh, with equipment, for example, you know, we, we've traditionally on this farm, we've, we've always kind of liked to run, you know, good used equipment and basically run it for as long as you can possibly efficiently run it right and then trade it off when it's not worth anything anymore basically and and you know start over again but it seems like with the technology on equipment these days the reliability to do that just isn't there you know we've got we you know we had a couple of case quad tracks with 5500 hours on them and the amount of money we were sinking into those things was just it's enough to make your stomach turn and you know our advisory board brought that up too. Like your repair bills are out there. And you know, that was after 2019. So we thought, okay, you know, it was a tough year. It was wet. Maybe that's, it was just a bit of a fluke, you know, maybe we kind of got through the bad year with the case tractors, but then 2020 was just as bad. So we're like, well, I guess now we know the green is the right color for, for this farm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we we ended up uh, nice. doing some upgrades and, and kind of changing our operating strategy around equipment to say, okay, you know, maybe maybe this this stuff with all these sensors and the and the emissions control systems and everything else, maybe we just can't operate with a strategy like that anymore. Maybe we need to run a little bit higher dollars on the equipment payments and lease payments and hope that we're going to get some of that back on the repairs and maintenance side and the custom work side and and maybe improve our timeliness and some things too and also reduce our stress and have a much better looking line of equipment you know that's the right color <laughs> this is crazy you're telling me you got an advisory board you didn't have to pay them like you know big bucks to tell you that you should be running better green equipment i think if this was the they sales did. point for getting an advisory <laughs> board every farmer listening to this would scramble out and, and, and get one yeah i mean I, I guess maybe there is some bias in our advisory board because one of the guys used to own maple farm equipment or part of it anyway and uh, so, i think i might know who you're talking about yeah so but i mean he <laughs> he also used to be a lender for rbc so he's also seen the uh the flip side of the danger of the equipment hormonal response syndrome that farmers tend to get. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, it's so funny because with our advisory board, I know Harvey and Terry always had the issue of, you know, them telling them not to buy equipment. And it was just, it's t- it's a tough thing where you have a year where it's like, hey, no capital expenditures. Because you know what happens like three months later, you forgot all about like the gravity of the meeting. And then, oh man, we really need this thing because of yada, 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 yada. And the salesman's right here in the yard and he can do this. And it's actually a really good deal that we're not going to have in another three months. And you know how the rationalizations go away. Eh? Oh yeah. You can talk yourself into it if you work hard enough. Yeah. E- equipment's hard because there's no, there's no right answer, right? With equipment, like you can have a guy that trades everything every year and you think, well, how does he afford that? And then you've got a guy that runs stuff that's so old, you wonder how it even runs, but both of them seem to make it work somehow. So, and there's no like, you know, study that I could go look at that says, okay, this model costs X dollars per acre and this model costs Y dollars per acre. So you should go with this strategy and kind of just have to figure it out. You can, you, you're building it yourself. You're saying, yeah, there's no template. No, not as far as I've found. Have you tried, had you tried like farming simulator 2020? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I farm enough in my, in my personal, like professional life. I don't need to farm in my personal life. Thank you very much. I guess that's weird. Yeah, that would be weird. That'd be like me going home and playing a distributor game. <laughs> if I'm going to spend time on my PlayStation, yeah, if I'm going to spend time on my PlayStation, it's going to be playing something something that's not farming. It's going to be like wrestling. <laughs> it's about as far. Well, maybe there's days of wrestling on the well, farm. but yeah. True enough. You yeah. dropped something there. I was just like, wow. It was giving me chills, and I'm sure the listener was wondering too. Can you share what does your personal professional estate look like in 2030? Yeah. So, I mean, we did, you know, like as a farm organization, we did, we did expect that we're going to have some growth, right. In terms of acres. I mean, look back on our farm. I look back to the nineties and the two thousands and the kind of growth that dad took the farm on. And I mean, it, it's quite remarkable how many more acres he took on in that amount of time that if we were to grow by that kind of a percentage today, we'd be, we'd be massive. And I know some farms have that as their plan and that's not ours. We, we want to grow enough that there's enough room for what I guess we're kind of dubbing as the cousin consortium. That if our kids, my sister's kids, you know, have the opportunity if they want to, to be able to come back to this farm, and I know that's a long way away. Like my, my oldest is five, but it's going to come quickly. And we need to start thinking about, okay, if we're going to open up that as an opportunity for them, how big does the farm need to be? And what other revenue streams do we potentially need to have available to us? So we're trying to keep sort of an entrepreneurial mindset around, you know, if, if there's a business that makes sense to buy, maybe we should buy it. You know, it it might be a little bit outside of our comfort zone, but those are just things that we're trying to prepare ourselves for. The other big thing that I think that's really important if we're going to make this next transition to generation four, and it's actually going to be successful, is we really need to professionalize our governance practices. You know, we're at a level now where things are working pretty well, but if you're talking potentially, I mean, who knows, six six kids that maybe want to come back to the farm, man, you need some serious uh, policies built up to decide who's going to be the CEO. Who's uh, how are you going to decide how much to pay them? How are you going to decide how they're going to acquire shares of the farm partnership or shares of the farm equity, which is even more of a hairy subject. So these are all things that it's a lot better to have figured out before you need them rather than after fascinating man that is incredible uh what in 2030 what was the biggest thing for you personally that you wanted to see baked into the cake for your business on a personal level like reflecting on your life off the farm well i mean you know on a personal level i don't know how much we necessarily went into that i mean certainly we did discuss though you know, like one, one point that my brother-in-law brought up, which I thought was interesting that, you know, he wants to be able to 
coach his kid in various sports, right? Like he, he wants to be there. And if he's going to be able to do that, that does mean that maybe we don't want to be a hundred thousand acre operation here. Although, I mean, certainly big farms has some advantages in terms of hiring and everything else to kind of make some of those roles work. But the growth from here to there requires hours and requires stress. So what I, what I took from the other individuals on the crew is that growth is good, but we don't want to farm the whole province of Saskatchewan, right? Certainly not by 2030 anyway. Personally, I, I'm a little bit more open to risk in that, you know, I would be okay with, with some growth. I, you know, that I get some, I, that's part of my drive, I guess. But at the same time, I want to be around for my kids too. And I want to be able to kind of continue doing some of the things that I do off the farm as well with, you know, some of the boards I'm involved in and, and trying to be a, a good advocate for agriculture and everything else. It takes time and it takes energy to do those things. And if I'm burning all of my energy and then some to try and, and, and do this perpetual growth machine, um, am I going to be able to handle it? Cause I think what I've kind of realized, you know, in the last year or so after dealing with a tough harvest and losing some land and everything else is that I have limits too. There's only so much, you know, stress that I can handle on a personal level. Um, so I, I have to, I have to stay aware of that and what my limits are. How are you, how are you shoring that up? How are you dealing with it when you're close to breaking? Well, I mean, so I guess I, I learned, like I said, I, I, I did learn a little bit what my limits were. Um, so I, you know, one of the best things that I did, and this was actually kind of ahead of a lot of the stress that I started looking into it was a leadership course that Kelly Dobson runs. You know, we did, basically it was a whole year and, you know, we, we went through and, and what I, what I thought it was going to be was a lot different than what it was. I thought it was going to be sort of like a leadership thing where, you know, like you manage your people better and those sorts of things, but it wasn't that it was about managing yourself and trying to make yourself better because if you can make yourself better, everyone around you will feed off of that and be better too. So that was a huge, that was a huge thing for me, that course. I, I learned a lot about who I am as a, as an individual and as a leader. And I learned a lot about the things that I'm good at and the things that I'm not as good at. And I also learned some, some tools to kind of help, you know, dealing with the anxiety and the stress of, of this business that, that we're involved in, you know, like stuff that I probably would have laughed off a few years ago, like meditation and, and mindfulness and, you know, some of those breathing exercises and, and, you know, also just reading some, some books and, and some things around mental health and trying to understand a little bit more about why I was feeling the way that I was coming out of that year. And I don't, I can't sit here and say that I've figured it all out and solved it all. Cause I, I haven't. Um, but I've made some really significant improvements and, and I think that I've been able to share that with my farm team. Some of the conversations that I've been able to have with my dad and my sister and my brother-in-law really one-on-one -on -one to try and understand what they want to do and, and, you know, sort of what their dreams are. They're, they're conversations that I never knew how to have before. So it's the change has been really big. So, I mean, I guess, you know, looking back on a year like 2019, yeah, it was really tough, but look at what, look at what I took out of it. Look at what I learned from it. There's lots of positives to be had in failure. So the teaching was really leadership for you, but the net impact was also on the people around you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, people react to how you act, right? Especially if you're the, in the leadership position, um, you know, if, if you're running across the yard to go load up the drill, everybody sees you running, right? Well, why is he in such a panic? What's, what's his hurry, right? It puts everybody in that frame of mind. So trying to slow that down 
and say, okay, sometimes it's really hard to just walk, but <laughs> I think it's better. Yeah. Better for everybody. That is a fascinating statement. And there's so much in that because yeah, I think so much gets unconsciously projected about what the state of affairs are and your state reflects on everybody else. And frankly, that's usually when bad decisions get made. That's when accidents happen. That's when everybody gets riled up and there's misunderstandings and miscommunication. Because, I mean, didn't we grow up in a panic farming? Like, hasn't it been just one giant race? Like, has anybody ever been taught to walk? No, it's exactly right. I mean, you know, any time that the dad was was working when I was young and I was, I was working with him. I mean, nine years old, I'm out shredding bales and running a combine and I didn't know what I was doing. I don't, I don't think that I want to do that with my kids. I, I want to let them get a little bit older and be kids a little bit longer than I think our generation and my parents' generation especially kind of had to do. Oh man. Just hit so close to home. You know, we had, before your, this episode, we talked to dad. We talked to our dad on the show and just drilling him. Like, we're drilling him from this perspective. But back then, it was more, it was it was so much more straightforward. There wasn't as much strategy or thought went into it as like, oh, I just went, I became an electrician because you need a trade to fall back on, you know, in case the farm goes down. It, it's just more doing. But now you're in a position where you can, have this infrastructure, advisory boards, peer groups, leadership training. You can reflect on your actions and where you're at and, and just build something way better by virtue of having some kind of awareness and strategy and plan to execute. It's so much more cognitive, right, than it ever was for them. For them, it was just you got to get the work done. But the stakes are so high now that it's it's much more cerebral focus. So at the end of the day, you're done. Like your brain is done. And you, sometimes you can't just put in those few more hours in the evening. Sometimes you can't work your way through every weekend because your, your brain needs a rest. And that was one thing that I took away from the leadership course was when you're, when you're cognitively worn out, you start reverting back to your reactive tendencies, which are never good, right? That's when you make the mistakes that hurt people and well, physically and emotionally, right? Cause you say things that you wouldn't normally say and you make bad decisions. We all, we all need to get home safe too, right? I mean, that's, if you don't have your health, what do you have? In the old days, it was nothing to lose a finger or two, you know, fixing the combine or, you know, mixing the sprayer tank with your arm or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they all they're all fine, right? <laughs> yeah, they're all fine. <laughs> we all turned out great. Oh man, the stories the stories dad has of spraying with a spray coop and an open cab with like that old two four D that all it did was really float in the air. Just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, the finest flood jet nozzles you can possibly get and just desis coming out the back and you get out and see if the bugs are dead. <laughs> Yeah. That's funny. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you, it's still about 2030, but it's a different angle. 2030, are you going to have no compaction, no tillage, diversity of species, you know, intensive livestock, no no chemicals and, and, and synthetic fertilizers? Are you going to be all regenerative? What does 2030 look like? Did you talk about changing farming practices at all? I mean, if you read the rest of producer, I mean, the change is imminent. So my answer to all of those is I could probably just say no to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> if it's black and white, right? If it's black and white, but. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say no because, you know, I always want to be open-minded, but, um, you know, maybe there's directions we can go around controlled traffic and stuff like that. Like I'm interested in, in looking into that equipment wise. It's a huge challenge to try and manage, but maybe there's a direction to go there. This regenerative thing, I don't know. I mean, you know, we used to have cows in the farm. It wasn't that long ago, really. Dad sold them off in the, in the early 2000s. So I grew up with them. I grew, I grew up with them enough to know how much I don't want to have them in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
that's functional too. Just find out you're not going to be a cattle guy. Yeah, I mean, and we actually talked about that, you know, when we were looking at her 2030, because Sarah, Sarah likes livestock and stuff. She goes to Agribition and helps out some friends there every year and, and other shows, but none of us have a drive for that. I mean, she, maybe she'll have some pets that she'll have around home, who knows, um, but it's not going to go farther than that. It, I, I understand the benefits to having livestock in the operation. I really do, but I want to have a life too. And, you know, a lot of it, it, you know, we're being told two different things, right? We're being told the cattle are ruining the environment. And then we're being told that we're supposed to go regenerative because, you know, reasons. And so personally, I think that this whole argument about beef being bad for the environment is ridiculous. I mean, we've got what, 10 million acres in Southwest Saskatchewan that is not suitable for annual crop production. I've got 27,000 acres on my doorstep just north of me here that was PFRA community pasture until it was sold off a few years ago by the government, but it still is going to remain community pasture. It's not, it's not good farmland. You could, so what do you do with it? Right. And it always used to be grazed. So what's the difference today versus 200 years ago when there were tens of millions of bison out here. So I just think the whole thing is kind of, that whole thing is kind of ridiculous. And I, I do get the benefits of having livestock in the rotation, but I just think that we're being told a lot of things like, oh, you know, you're going to do this stuff and you're not going to need fertilizer anymore and you're not going to need to spray anymore and all this stuff. And I don't know, my spidey sense starts tingling when I hear things that are too good to be true. And that just sounds too good to be true to me. Balanced mineral nutrition in the soil is far more important than anything else if we can get a good balance of background nutrients in there reduce compaction try and fix some of the hard pan issues that we have in the solenetic soil that we farm and that's the direction that we want to go is try and deal with these hard pan spots the crusting that comes with solenetic soil that none of that has been fixed in the hundred years that it that we've been that this soil has been farmed so that's what we want to try and focus on figuring out and I think that there's some things we can try and there's some things that we have been trying that we'll find out if they work. You need some gypsum. We tried that this fall. We found some. So we, we treated 40 acres with about four to 8,000 pounds per acre of gypsum. So we'll see what happens. Kind of interested in deep ripping too, but. You also need drainage though, eh? We also need drainage. I mean, that's a huge issue, right? So that, that's something we're working on, but we don't have an outlet in our area. So we're a bit of a basin so we can drain, but we're really only draining like this slough into another slough. So we need some way to get that water out of here. So that's a much longer term project that we're also trying to work on, but COVID sort of put a bit of a a pin in that for now. Is there opportunities to have larger scale, uh, water, water infrastructure built in the community? I believe there's a desire for it. Um, you know, Eric, my brother-in-law has been kind of leading that one and he's been trying to get started on the development of a conservation and development district, but it's a tremendous project to get enough farmers on side and, and everything else. But I, I do think the desire is there. We've all seen the kind of damage that this area can face in a year like 2010 and 2011 when it never stops raining. Um, and the years and years that it takes for that water to go away when it has nowhere to go and the salinity that it leaves behind. You follow policy and, you know, you've been a bit of a voice for, for agriculture abroad and, and you've been uh, writing about it. It's something you're passionate about. What do you think are the most critical issues you're facing as a primary producer as far as uh, social license and conscience and the regulatory uh, outlook goes? Well, let's start broad with this one. I, I think that it's just the fact that so few of us farm. So few of us have a connection to farms. I mean, what's the statistics? Less than 2% of Canadians farm. I mean, and it wasn't that long ago that everybody was at least only one generation removed, but now, you know, with, with immigration, which certainly has its benefits, I'm not trashing it. Um, and just longer periods of time, more generations removed from the farm. People just don't have firsthand knowledge and experience of it. They, they 
maybe the memory they have is their grandpa's farm with the big red barn and every kind of different livestock and driving around with an open air tractor, but that's not agriculture today. So somehow we have to overcome this lack of, of numbers to get government policy to really reflect what we actually need at the farm level, which is in most cases, especially in the last few years, very different from what we've been getting. So I think it's a, it's a huge problem that needs a lot of people and a lot of resources and no one of us can handle this one on our own. We all have to try and do something to try and get out there and, and talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Is it everybody do a little bit of advocating or, or everybody get behind those that have that unique ability to advocate? Because that's not everybody's jam. No, no, that's right. No, I mean, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that everybody should do it because not everybody has that, you know, interest and not everybody wants to. And I certainly can't blame them. It's exhausting. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, share your experience, right? You've been writing. You've been trying to do some good in the world. Yeah, I mean, at certain points, you just need a break from it almost. Like, you know, sometimes I'll just take months where I don't really do anything with it because, I I mean, I still have my role with Sassweed, of course, and that's not changing. But um, sometimes as far as writing or sharing or doing those sorts of things, you just you just need a break from it because it burns, it burns you out. I mean, you've seen how many, you know, farmers that have done the advocacy thing and then sort of quit because they, they just get burned out of it. So they beat up. Yeah, they do. And sometimes, unfortunately, by other farmers, which is which is really unfortunate. So I think what, you know, what I think would be better is that we rally behind the people who are doing this, who are doing a really good job of it because of the energy that it takes to do it. They need they need support and they're only one farmer, too. I mean, there's only so much that I can speak about as a grain in, a grain operation in Southeast Saskatchewan, I don't have cows, so I can't really speak about that, but other people can. And I'm more than willing to provide support to those people, right? When they're talking about their own issues. So I just, I, I want agriculture to, to more rally around those people who are doing a good job and not, you know, not get after them because they're not saying exactly the right thing for each farm. Because of course they never will be able to get it exactly right for every farm. But what's the danger if nobody does? What if you just go and did your business, you know, sailed into 2030 and focused on that? I mean, why do you, why do you care? What's the difference? Well, and I mean, that's a, it's a fair question because I mean, we don't know for sure that we're having much of an impact either. Right. But if we're going to continue to see policy come through that, you know, penalizes farmers for doing good things. I mean, look at the carbon tax. I mean, not that the pushback against it has really achieved all that much so far, but man, talk about something that, that isn't helpful for Canadian agriculture. Maybe if we could get a program in where we could get paid for sequestering carbon, then we've got a whole new revenue stream like that. That would change how I think a lot of us would look at this thing. But if we don't push for it, we won't get it. You know, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like trying to get a better interest rate on your loans at the bank. They're not just going to give it to you. You have to ask for it. And you kind of have to keep asking for it, right? And I think that's, that's what politicians need. They need to hear it over and over and over and over again, because they just have, for the most part, such a lack of understanding of what actually happens at the farm level. Is that not the end goal with the carbon tax to get to get farmers paid or is it some other some other thing or what do you think the focus is or the opportunity there if there's one? I don't know, listening to some of the policy that the government's the feds have been putting in place around carbon sequestration and not rewarding any activity before 2017 and I mean that that tells me that no, they really aren't interested in trying to get us to do better things. That tells me that they're just looking for dollars. And I think that's really frustrating. If we're going to have a carbon market in Canada, it needs to be a carbon market. If I sequester a ton of carbon, whatever the market price is for that ton of carbon, I should be able to get paid if somebody wants to buy it. That's a functioning market. Trying to say that, oh, these practices don't apply because they're already being done. 
Well, that just totally distorts the whole market. So I don't think it's a very effective way of looking at it. And unfortunately, that seems to be the direction that the government is going right now. I, I hope that that will change. Is this the biggest issue pressing for producers or is there other areas that you'd, if you had a choice to make an impact that you would look at first? I would say that right now, that's probably one of the bigger issues that maybe producers should be looking at. I mean, there's lots of other things. I mean, market access is kind of faded as a big problem, but it hasn't gone away. Like COVID-19 sort of encouraged countries to stockpile but what's going to happen once that's done, right? Are we going to go back to these same old issues of, of trying to block Canadian imports because of this, that, or the other thing? I think that it might. So these issues can't just be forgotten about. We got to keep working on them. And we, we do rely on a lot of the national organizations, you know, like Pulse Canada, Serials Canada, the Canadian Canola Council, like those organizations put a ton of work into trying to keep our markets open. And we never really hear that much about it. Are high prices bad for farmers? Oh man, that's a good question, Dan. Because <laughs> I mean, I really enjoyed this run of high prices here. Not that, <laughs> not that I had my whole canola crop to sell for $18, but of course I didn't. <laughs> Should have held. <laughs> but, you know, it's gonna come with some consequences. I mean, land prices are gonna keep going up. Um, you know, some of the, some of the land rent prices have been going up, equipment prices, fertilizer prices. We always end up paying for the cost of increasing grain prices at some point. So there's, there's consequences to it for sure. But right now it's sure helpful. If your advisory board gives you permission to update your equipment to green, that's all good, brother. <laughs> you're on the right if that was their advice i just can't get i gotta tell terry you know i talked to jake on the podcast guess what his advisory board said to do keep newer green iron and guess who's on the board run newer stuff well you know they they didn't really say green i might have i might have inserted that line myself you know <laughs> but <laughs> 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 stuff that works not case oh that's funny that's really funny um so where i i guess i wanted to go next was you know it's you, you're not just you're not just blogging you know you've been traveling around a little bit and giving your time to to different boards tell us a little bit about the impact of being part of like the global farmer network uh sas wheat development commission cereals canada and stuff like that sure yeah, so I mean, I uh, I got invited to join the Global Farmer Network in 2017, and uh, that fall, we basically what basically what they do is they take a group of farmers that are scattered from all over the world. So there were 14 of us. So I was the Canadian one there at that time. There was a couple Americans, and then you know we had Nigeria, uh, India, China, um, Uganda, a few other places. You know all in there as well and we basically had what you'd almost kind of if you're watching you think it was a peer group meeting like we were just talking about issues this was down in des moines iowa around the world food prize event and you know what we what i realized during that was that we generally all kind of have the same problems we fight with government regulation we have challenges with limited uh, knowledge of the general population about how their food is produced and now they want to be involved with it and don't know that much about it we all have trouble sourcing good labor and we all struggle with the cost of equipment right it just on a different scale depending on where you farm right so that what that experience did and kind of attending the world food prize at the same time was really kind of opened my eyes to like this really is a worldwide thing, you know, I mean, I almost, I guess I almost kind of thought we were a little bit in silos as farmers, like this country has these issues and that country has these other ones, but, but no, we really are all on the same side of this for the most part, you know? So anyway, after that, I, I ran and got elected on the board of Sask Wheat as a director. And that was, so I guess my term ends here in the fall and I'll be up for reelection and um, also through that, I got involved with Cereals Canada, which is a national organization that SAS Wheat's a, a part of. So those are kind of my three, three bigger ones, I guess, that I'm, that I'm involved with. 
Um, the Global Farmer Network isn't, you know, like Sasquatch, it's a checkoff organization, right? You get your ton, dollar per ton that goes to Sasquatch, and it's invested in generally research with some market development work that a group like Cereals Canada does. Um, and then, you know, producer communications and government advocacy, that sort of thing. That's sort of what Sasquatch does. Um, whereas the Global Farmer Network is, is really just a group of farmers that try and volunteer their time to make things better around the world for farmers. So that's kind of... Are you guys having an impact? I think so. I think so. It's a good organization. I mean, the farmers that are involved in it, like the passion that, that I see in there from farmers from, you name it, Argentina, you know, like I said, India, the UK, I mean, it's, it really is incredible. And, uh, you know, just learning some things that they deal with. It's just, it's really, we're pretty lucky, honestly, to farm where we farm. <laughs> Even though we have, we got it good, man. Canada's still great. Canada's still great. Yeah. So no, it's, it's, it's been a really good organization to be involved with and just, just how it kind of opens your eyes to what's going on in the world outside of the world that, you know, it's worth a lot. You recently wrote about the nature of us having conversation and how a person's position can be negated just because of assumptions and, and no headway is made. It's just, you're, you're eliminated from having a dialogue. What, 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 what are you trying to say about us being able to speak to one another and work through some of this? What I've become a little bit tired of in general over the past few years is cancel culture. I mean, it, it's like if somebody said something 20 years ago, that's considered bad. Now it's like, you know, you just bring them down and don't allow them to have a platform anymore. And we all should be able to learn from mistakes that we make in the past. I mean, yeah, it, certain things are unacceptable and, and there's consequences to free speech sometimes, but freedom of speech should not be let go of. I mean, that's where countries really get themselves into trouble and end up going down some pretty dark paths. We don't want to go there. So what I think has happened is we get on social media and we only see people that we agree with on Twitter. We follow the people we generally agree with on Facebook. We may have lots of friends that vote differently than we do, but we don't see what they say. Same thing with Instagram. So we never really hear the other side of things. And then when we finally do, we're so, it's so foreign to us that we just can't comprehend that somebody could think that way. And then what I see happening on social media, when somebody realizes, oh my goodness, somebody thinks so totally different from me. It's not, oh wow, what can I learn from that? It's, well, they're wrong. Like there's no point in even talking to them because they're just wrong. The example that I, that I related when I wrote that post was, uh, my dad has for as long as I've been around been good friends with, uh, with a guy who, you know, has been involved with a union, you know, worked at a, worked at a union job for his whole life, right? His whole working life always, you know, was sort of like left leaning and, and dad's not right. He's the opposite of that. So I got to listen to their discussions lots of times, but they never got mad at each other. And they always came out of it with a view of the other side, with a view of what somebody else thinks and, and how they view the world. And no, it doesn't change their minds, it doesn't change their politics, but it does soften their stance a little bit. And it does allow them to see that that's a human being on the other side that's worthy of compassion, worthy of having a conversation with. And I think we've forgotten how to do that as a society. Well said. No, oh, I love it. I got one final question for you, my friend, and then we'll wrap it up. I do love uh, some of the ground that we, that we covered, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And I think farmers will be uh, very interested to hear your perspective. How did Churchill give people hope, and, and why do we need that now? Yeah, okay. So you're going to bring me back to a blog I wrote a couple months ago. <laughs> so I'll see if I can remember <laughs> <laughs> well, I read nothing a, like putting you on a spot here on the internet. You know, it's only going to last forever. <laughs> I read a fantastic book called *The Splendid in the Vile*, 
And if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, and it, it really chronicles Churchill and his family and how they got through the Blitz during World War II. And the things that he did to kind of rally people around, not necessarily him, but around who they were as the UK, it was telling them the brutal, honest truth, right? Like the bombs are going to drop and people are going to die and it's going to be really, really bad but we're going to win. It's just that, that brutal honesty, but following it up with the belief that no matter what happens, we will make it through. We'll endure. That's what I think, that's the lesson that I think we need to remember today is that when we're dealing with the coronavirus and everything else, we don't need politicians to, to sugarcoat what's going on to us. We just need them to be honest with us and treat us like the adults that we are and give us some inspiration to see the end of this. Damn. That's what I think we can learn from Churchill. She give you a megaphone and put you up somewhere, you know, on the steps of some important building and have a little bit of a protest here soon so we can all go back to regular life if that, you know, if that's part of the goal, but yeah. <laughs> it's coming soon to a town near you, regular life, I hope. Yeah, well, we will make it though. We'll persevere. Yeah, I hope so. Well, and I mean, I think there there is some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines coming out and everything else. I've actually gotten both of the vaccines from Moderna. What? Because um, I, I, for a long time, I've been on a like part-time basis with, with our local ambulance. So I serve as an emergency medical response, responder with that. So, we, so we're considered frontline as a result of that. So... So yeah, I've, I've gotten it and I'm still alive and nothing bad has happened to me. So don't worry about the vaccine. Oh. I thought they were just going to give you like a, a vaccine, a vaccine because you're a farmer and you're an essential service. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Got to get the crop in. You can't get sick. Wow. Yeah. It'd be nice to get that out of the way, but, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think we're, I, th I think we're near the end of this and I think that, uh, by the fall, things are going to look a lot more normal. And I, a lot of people are saying, oh, we're never going back to normal. I don't know about you, but I'm sure looking forward to having some beers at some farm shows and stuff like that and seeing people again. There's only so much more Zoom I can take. I totally agree. I was at the Forks on the weekend and just seeing people together, just being able to sit down and drink a craft beer and have some nachos with people in public. Like... It is extraordinary. And uh, hey, there's always a silver lining. I think it's going to be that all those things we took for granted a thousand times before are going to be as precious as we can imagine for the rest of our lifetimes. I don't think it's going to go away soon. The feeling like, hey, for a year, they took this away from us. And it's the best thing. It's, it's the most important thing in your life. And I love your stories about you know, family farming members that are focused in 10 years on the ability to spend quality time with your families. Cause frankly, you know, when we were growing up, that wasn't a peer pressure kind of thing. Like, Hey Bill, are you taking your kids to hockey? Well, <laughs> I mean, on the farm, it's like, you're shutting down the tractor to go to the rink. Uh, you're a loser <laughs> basically. So. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> you're insane. Yeah, no way. <laughs> yeah, that just that just didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's one nice thing about a bigger about farms getting a little bit bigger. I think there's a little bit more room for that now because there's usually somebody else who can help you out. You know, fill in your role and stuff like that. I believe as companies progress, you know, they, they it becomes a little bit about the business serving the people in it because otherwise the people don't stay. Yeah, that's a very good point. Cool. Hey, man, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, it's really funny to think about, you know, where we're at with the show relative to the first time that we tried this. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. I think you were my very first podcast guest. Yeah, you were my very first. We were talking about that the other day. You were my very first podcast guest that I didn't even have the nuts to uh, the balls to publish. I just. <laughs> you probably burned it. <laughs> was really comfortable with you and I thought, 
you know, I was wanted to hear what you had to say and we did the episode, but I don't even know if I have the recording somewhere, but anyways, now we're in season three, you know, we survived, we got a fully produced show or whatever. And you know, it was worth it. I think, I think, you know, people are really going to enjoy hearing your perspective, Jake, and I appreciate everything that you're doing with agriculture. And, you know, when I see someone like writing a blog, like you did about, Hey, like people, like let's have a dialogue, like let's, let's work together a little bit here. We don't need to cancel each other and, and we can have some communication and maybe achieve some things through that methodology. I mean, that's like a voice of reason in the wilderness and we need more of it. So keep doing what you're doing. You know, I know it takes a lot of energy to be doing what you're doing, but, um, sharing it makes a difference and it was nice like you got a lot of positive feedback on that too right i think for some people it might have been something that they needed to hear you know like i i don't have any uh aspirations with my blog that i'm gonna you know be a worldwide star because of it i just i just write things that i like writing about and this was something that's been bothering me for a long time and sometimes the best way for me to work through an issue is to write it out and i'm glad that people are getting some 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 value out of it and and getting some good feelings from it that means that means the world to me that i can put something out there that people are going to enjoy i did and i hope that others in the agricultural community get that memo think before you drink and click send because <laughs> that's what it somebody's drinking yeah. hard alcohol out there and just putting out whatever's coming to their head and that's not even helping us it's not even helping us. No. Twitter is a, uh, it can be a great, uh, a great tool, but it can be a ugly place sometimes. Some, sometimes the best thing you can do when you're about to send out an emotional response is just put the phone down for a few hours and let yourself cool down and see if you still feel like sending it. Good, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And I wish you all the best. I hope get lots of rain timely rains out there and uh everything looks good this year same to you guys dan this is a lot of fun appreciate it thanks so much jake thank you mm-hmm.